Okay, everyone, we are back with another biotechnology live stream. Hello again. Uh, my name is Dr. Danielle Snowflack. I am the Senior Director of Education um, at Edvotech. Um, and we are so happy to be bringing you this uh, biotechnology uh, training workshop, again, to the comfort, to your com comfort of you in your own home. Um, you know, we've gotten great feedback on these workshops. We have some teachers who actually tune in with their classes for these workshops, either live or um, in replay. So um, if you're here, let us know in the chat window. We'd love to hear from you. Um, we want to hear your questions. Um, and, you know, I'm just really glad to be able to be with you um, talking about biotechnology today. And so for those of you, um, you know, who are new to our live streams, um, we are Edvotech. We are the biotechnology education company. Uh, we were founded over 30 years ago now um, by Dr. Jack Churchian, who was a professor of, of biochemistry at Georgetown University. Um, and what I think it's important to remember is that, um, you know, 30 years ago um, was a really pivotal um, time in biotechnology. Um, and one of the technologies that was developed in this time was the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, but you know, this technology allowed for um, innovations like DNA fingerprinting, um, genetic engineering, um, a, a lot of molecular cloning, a lot of techniques that we do in the lab every day today, um, you know, is made possible by the discovery of PCR. Um, and so all of this technology was happening in research labs, but little of it was being translated into um, the classroom, the teaching lab. And so we all know the best way to get our students engaged and excited is through hands-on experimentation, um, and thus Edvotech was born. Um, our focus is on educators. Um, you know, we want to work, we work with educators all over the world to help demystify science um, and foster the next generation of scientists through hands-on active learning activities. But the one thing I, I will point out is that PCR and the technology that we're doing today and the instrumentation that we're using today is all the same instrumentation that instrumentation that's being used in research labs around the world today. Um, so even though we make things student friendly, they are rigorous and robust enough to stand up to, their, to a research lab. And I think that's pretty cool and, and pretty cool for students to know. So, um, you know, if you're here, let us know where you're coming from in the chat box. Um, again, we want to hear any questions um, you may have about PCR, about doing these experiments in your class. Um, you know, we're just really happy to have you joining us today. And so let's get down to the science. Uh, the polymerase ch chain reaction, or PCR, is a simple and elegant method to copy pieces, specific pieces of DNA in vitro. And because of its use, the ease of its use and its ability to rapidly amplify DNA, PCR has become indispensable in the medical and life sciences lab. And so this is a technique your students, you know, if they decide to go further in their training in the biomedical sciences, this is a technique that they may use every day. I know I did um, as a grad student. And so one thing that's really cool is that today in the lab, you know, your students can extract and amplify sequences in their own DNA. Um, and I think that relationship really resonates with students. And so they can kind of see um, something about their own DNA sequence um, on a gel. Um, however, in the midst of the global pandemic, um, I think it's fair to say that these experiments may not look like they did last year. Uh, you may be teaching in person, online, in a hybrid format, um, with a realization that things can change at any minute. And so in today's workshop, we'll be discussing the way students can extract and analyze their DNA in the lab. Now, the most common extraction protocol and the easiest one to use, I think, is the cheek cell um, DNA prep, where your students are gonna wash out their mouths with saline and then extract the DNA from those cells. However, I'm sure teachers, you are very aware that that is probably a COVID protocol no-no. You know, everyone is gonna be wearing their masks during the workshop. You especially don't wanna cause aerosols with students spitting and swishing. And so today we're gonna to discuss a modification of the protocol in which you can use the hair cells um, to, to amplify and extract DNA. Um, Plus, you know, you, you may be teaching in class on alternate days. We have some teachers who are teaching on um, Mondays and Tuesdays, and then their students are virtual Thursdays and Fridays. Um, and, you know, how do you plan a lab? How do you do pre-lab prep, um, you know, when half of your class is in person and half of it is online? Um, and so uh, one of the things that I'm going to be showing you today 
um, you know, is, is something the origami organelle for PCR is something that an activity you can do with your students on alternate days so that they're ready and prepared to go into the lab afterwards. Um, we're going to be demonstrating kit 334, which is human DNA typing using PCR, um, which is a very popular experiment to be done in the teaching classroom. However, this protocol is applicable for any of our human PCR experiments. So if you're doing the PTC tasting um, experiment, if you like the mitochondrial DNA experiment, um, this cheek cell, this uh, hair cell protocol will be applicable for any of them. So this demonstration, oh, and one more thing, um, we are also going to be using the EdvoCycler Junior for this. Um, so the EdvoCycler Junior is the premier personal PCR machine um, in that, you know, um, I just think this machine is really fantastic. Um, you know, it is at a price that is really approachable for teachers um, to be able to bring it into the classroom. Um, and one of the nice things about this unit is, you know, it's self-contained. The operating system is on the touch screen with the unit. We have active heating and cooling, so it's fast. And um, so, you know, it really outperforms, um, you know, similarly priced machines. We just think it's a fantastic unit. And so there is a giveaway for that. Um, and Maria posted the link in the chat box. Um, that contest is closing soon, so be sure to sign up um, to be able to win an Edvo Cycler Junior. Then we are also recording this demonstration and the slides will be available on our website. So if you'd like to be notified when they're posted, please fill out the form. The link is in the chat box. Um, and we are also offering professional development certificates to those who attend live. So if you'd like us to send you a certificate, um, please fill out the survey that is in the other link uh, that Maria posted. Um, I'll leave that up there for an hour after the workshop. So about 5, 5 p.m. Eastern time um, that, um, that form will be up. And, you know, we will then send you a professional development certificate, which can be used at school. So let's get to science. So we're focusing on human DNA amplification in this lab. Um, in humans, DNA is packaged into 23 pairs of chromosomes. Um, and though, although most of the DNA, and what you can see here is a, a karyotype of human DNA. Um, and this is labeled uh, with brightly colored fluorescent probes that look for different regions on the, on the human chromosomes. Um, and this is called a fluorescent in situ polymerization. Um, and so um, we're using fluorescence, we're using them in situ, so where they are on the chromosomes. Um, and the hybridization is between the, the probes and the DNA sequence of the chromosomes. Um, you can see that this is a male, because we have an X and a, a, this person is genetically male, they have a Y and an X chromosome. Um, and we can see that there are, you know, 22 pairs of autosomes. Um, and so, um, in humans, we've got DNA packaged into these chromosomes, and although the, most of this DNA is identical between individuals, small sequence difference or polymorphisms are going to occur at specific locations throughout the genome. These are heritable differences, meaning that they are from mom and dad, and they segregate in a Mendelian fashion. These polymorphisms include single base pairs, repetitive DNA elements, um, deletions, and more. And so PCR, um, this polymerase chain reaction, can be used to analyze polymorphisms at several different locations or loci within the human genome. Um, each person's genome is going to be unique. Um, and these tiny changes can tell you a lot about a person, their heredity, physical characteristics, or even about disease. And so we can think about these small sequences within our DNA as like a fingerprint that can tell the difference between people. So let's advance. So let's think about actual fingerprinting. Let's, let's all take a look at our hands. And so at the macro, our hand level, our hands are all the same. So we have five fingers on each hand, which attach to our palm. The palm attaches to the wrist, which attaches to the arm and so forth and so on. Um, and that will be, you know, um, applicable for most people. You know, there are obviously exceptions. Um, but when we look at our fingerprints, you know, we can see small differences, microscopic differences between each of our hands. And so each finger is going to have a unique combination of loops, whirls, and swirls, which can differentiate each of us from each one another. And so in the same way, the combinations of polymorphisms can be used to differentiate between individuals. So let's think about chromosome number two, okay? Um, so that's gonna be that second chromosome from the top left of the picture. It's labeled with a number two. Um, 
each fingerprint is going to have a unique array of loops, whirls, and swirls, which different to each of us. Um, in the same way, these combinations of polymorphisms in our DNA can be used to differentiate between individuals. So if we're thinking about position A on chromosome 2, um, this, is, this is a locus, so a specific location on the chromosomes. And let's just pretend that th this location we have a single nucleotide polymorphism or a SNP. Now this is a location where the DNA sequence differs by a single letter. I might have an A at this position, and you might have a T, and someone else another A. And this is powerful information um, for learning more about genetics. And so if we look again at specific locations within the genome, we can learn a lot about a person. Um, yes, they are loops, whirls, and arches. Um, I do like the way whirls and swirls rhyme with one another, but thank you for correcting me. You are very correct. Um, but if we look at, so if we look at these different locations within the genome, we can learn a lot about a person. Um, and since each person's genome contains a different combination of these polymorphisms, we can generate a unique DNA profile for that person. And the results become incredibly specific. So that's one of the reasons that DNA sequence information is used by forensic scientists to analyze different suspects or victims. And, uh, you know, we have a couple live streams where we do talk about forensic biology. They are available on our YouTube channel. Um, if you um, are so interested, definitely check them out. Um, but the, many of these differences don't mean anything. So, you know, if we're changing at a single location from an A to a T, that might not even result in an amino acid change in a protein. Or if it does change the amino acid, it might be conservative. So we might be going from one charged amino acid to another, or one hydrophobic amino acid to another. And so that might not actually change the function of the protein. And these are gonna be silent changes. Um, they're, they're not necessarily going to change an organism, the way an organism looks or acts or responds to stress. Um, some of these markers can actually be used for genealogy in determining which communities an individual descended from. Um, others can be responsible for normal genetic difference, like I featured here on this slide. So, you know, um, while we don't know the exact sequences or the exact genes that are um, necessarily causing some of these traits, we do know that they seem to be um, linked to specific, loca specific single locations on the chromosome. And so, like, you can all hold up your thumb um, and the difference between having a straight thumb and a thumb that, you know, tilts back, um, you know, that has been traced to be a, a genetic difference. And, and some traits are more complex and they're influenced by multiple genes and multiple factors, um, you know, whether or not you can roll your tongue, um, you know, hair color, eye color. Um, these are all considered to be multigenic um, change and they would result from sequence differences in several different genes. And so those, again, are um, taking the genotype, so what's in our genes, the sequences in our DNA, um, and taking it to our phenotype, which is our observ observable phenomenon. And so there are mutations that do cause genetic disease. Um, common mutations are going to include BRCA1, which has been indicated in um, breast cancer. We have CFTR508 deletion, which is the most common mutation found um, in individuals with cystic fibrosis. Um, or, you know, a deletion in the SNA gene, um, which is going to result in a progressive um, loss of motor neurons. And so these are some, just a few genetic diseases um, where we know where they're located in the human genome um, and we can target those sequences to determine what sequence caused the problem. And so to study these things within our genome, we need to extract DNA we need, and we need to amplify it so that we have enough to be able to analyze it. And so in the teaching laboratory, um, we can extract DNA from student cells we use PCR to specifically target and amplify areas within the genome where the genome where there are genetic differences, and the results are analyzed by PCR. Um, we take those PCR samples and then we run them on a gel, um, and we can see what the results are. And that's what we would do in the classroom. If we were in a diagnostic lab, we might be using DNA sequencing or next generation sequencing to analyze some of these differences. Um, but you know, I'm going to focus on what we can do in the student teaching lab today. And so for the purpose of this workshop, I want us to have results at the end. So I want to get our DNA samples running. Um, so we're going to run some PCR samples that were previously prepared on this gel, and then we will analyze the results at the end. All right, so let me get my camera rolling. Um, okay, so here we go. 
We are going to wear gloves. We always want to wear gloves um, when we're performing our experiments. Um, you know, this is going to protect us even when we are um, not necessarily doing experiments that have hazardous or toxic, toxic results. I mean, especially with PCR, we want to consider the fact that, you know, there, we could potentially contaminate our samples, our human samples with our own human DNA. And so wearing the gloves are very important for the experiment. And so, um, so what do we need to analyze our samples for electrophoresis? So first we are going to need our samples. So I have them here and I'm going to be loading them while I'm talking. And so electrophoresis is actually a very versatile technique. Um, it can be used to separate a variety of molecules, nucleic acid, including DNA and RNA, um, proteins and dyes. So in this experiment, we are analyzing DNA samples generated by PCR. So this first sample, oop, I need to adjust my pipette. This first sample that I'm going to load, this is our DNA standard. And then I'm going to be loading samples uh, that were extracted from cheek cell and hair cell um, and then amplified using PCR. And so what you're going to notice is our samples sink to the bottom of the well. And this is really important. Um, you know, what we include in our PCR, with our PCR kits, we, we do um, include reagents that make it easy for your students to load the gels. Um, you know, some of the innovations that are going to include, um, you know, like we, we want these examples to be simple and easy for your students. So we can see as we have an orange sample here, this is our PCR sample. Our PCR primers actually have dyes included, um, and those dyes... Um, allow us to know that A, our primers are added, which is very important because we want to know that all of our reagents are added before doing our experiment. Um, and this dye is going to allow us to track how far our samples are running through the gel. The next thing that's important um, with our PCR Edvo bead, uh -oh, where did my sample go? I want to keep that out so I have a record of the order. Um, the next thing that's important about the PCR Edvo bead is that it also contains reagents that are going to make these samples more dense than the electrophoresis buffer. And so that's going to mean that our samples are going to see, sink into the wells of our gel. And that's important because if the samples were not more dense when we loaded them like this, um, they would just flow out of the wells because the two samples would be of an equal density. But what happens here is because our samples are more dense, you can see as I load the gel, they are going to sink into the wells um, and thus be in the proper location to be separated by electrophoresis. And so agros is our medium for separation. And I do talk about this more in depth in other um, training workshops. Um, we can think about uh, this agarose as our scientific jello. Um, this agarose is going to act like a molecular strainer or sieve. Let me get this last sample loaded. And so that's going to help us separate our DNA molecules by size. Yes, so thank you. The first well is going to be the ladder of our known fragments. That's our DNA standard. Um, and that DNA standard is important because it's going to allow us to compare the sizes. So, you know, with our PCR samples, it's experimental. We don't necessarily know, um, especially with an experiment like this, and I'll talk about why later, we don't really know the size that our samples or our fragments are going to be. And so this ladder lets us know, uh, lets us compare and estimate the sizes. Okay, what else do I have here? Our electrophoresis buffer, and um, that's a combination of buffer and salt. Um, there are two reasons we use this buffer um, instead of water. First, um, the electricity um, is going to we use electricity to separate the molecules. Water is a poor conductor of electricity. So when we mix the salts with water, they allow the current to flow through the gel. Um, the second is that since we are working with biological samples, we're working with DNA, we want to keep them at a pH that does not disrupt their start, their charger structure. And so this buffer um, is going to keep our DNA molecules happy and charged. So I always like to make sure that my samples are running in the same right direction. I can see bubbles at both terminals, meaning my everything is connected um, and we are running current. Um, you know, we'll keep an eye on the progress of the gel. Um, you can start to see my dyes moving out of the wells from the black to the red terminals. Um, and so that is a good sign that we are running in the correct direction from negative to positive. Um, and that's the way our DNA samples are going to run. Um, you know, um, I so we have my our gel and our buffer are in the electrophoresis chamber. The chamber is wired at each end with terminals that are connected to leads. 
These leads are then connected to a power supply, which generate the current to do the separation. Um, I used an adjustable volume microwave pipette to load my samples. And what you would saw is that as I was loading the samples, I was changing the pipette tip between samples. And this is important, especially in human DNA experiments, because we want to prevent um, cross-contamination. That would mean that we would be um, accidentally contaminating one sample with the second sample. Um, and so in this case, you know, if it happens, it will likely change the experiments of our results because no people are going to have the exact same combination um, of alleles uh, in this case. Um, but, you know, this actually represents a learning moment. Um, so you want to have your students analyze and explain what went wrong as carefully as what went right with the experiment because it's important to acknowledge that science can be messy, there can be mistakes, and even experiments that don't work can teach us important lessons. So I've got the safety carrot cover on, I've turned on my electrophoresis chamber, and we can start to see the DNA migrating. And so for now, I'm going to keep the video running on the gel chamber so that you can watch as, the, as we resolve the DNA, uh, as DNA goes through the, the gel. Um, you'll be able to see our tracking dye move. Um, and I'm eventually going to move that because I want to demonstrate some other stuff, but I'll keep that on for now. So let's talk a little bit about the electrophoresis chambers. Um, again, I cover this more in depth in other workshops, um, but basically, you know, we offer two uh, multiple fantastic systems um, for electrophoresis that will, that can be um, used for different classroom setups. If you're teaching, if you're doing distance learning versus, um, you know, in-person learning, um, the slow, the the slide features two different systems. Um, the unit I'm using is the M12, which can run up to two gels at once. So we would have one gel here and one gel here. So if you're in a teaching lab um, with this power supply, which can power two M12s, um, this setup would accommodate up to 12 students, which would be two lab groups with six students each. If you're looking for an all-in-one solution, we've just introduced the Edvitech Edge, and this unit combines the electrophoresis chamber, the power supply, and the visualization system into one compact, easy-to-use unit. And we have several other options as well, and they can all be found at edvotech.com. So before we perform, oh, let me advance to the next slide. Oop, where are you going? Did I just lose my live stream? Nope, I'm still going. For some reason, my computer brought up the link instead of advancing to the next slide. Oh, here we go. Okay. It's always fun to have technical difficulties when you're live, um, but you know, you all are teachers. I'm sure you know um, how that goes. Um, you know, and technical, again, this is part of being, uh, you know, part of adapting to teaching online. Um, so um, before we can perform many of these molecular biology and biotechnology experiments, we have to isolate the DNA from cells. And I talked about this more in last week's live stream. And again, that is present online. Um, on our YouTube channel, so you can go back and watch that. Um, but, you know, um, like the researchers before us, we use the chemical properties of DNA to separate it from the other components of cells. Um, if you want specifics, go to last week's live stream. But to summarize, um, due to the nature of the sugar phosphate backbone of DNA, DNA has an overall negative charge. And this makes it soluble in water. And that's a good thing because in our cells, in our cytoplasm, it's largely water. And so to break open our cells, we are gonna resuspend them in DNA extraction buffer. The buffer solution is used for the purpose of lysing or breaking open the cells. It breaks down the cell and nuclear membranes, allowing the DNA to be released. Most DNA extraction buffers contain a buffer, obviously, um, to stabilize the sample's pH, um, a chelating agent, which binds to metal ions, and that allows us to inactivate DNases, which are enzymes that chew up DNA. If we're studying DNA, obviously you don't wanna chew up the DNA before you even get to the analysis. Um, and it also is going to include a detergent that's going to dissolve lipids like the cell membrane, uh, the nuclear membrane, because we want to get at that DNA and we want to be able to analyze it. So we burst the cells by disrupting the cell membranes. The resulting lysate con consists of cytoplasm, metabolites, DNA, RNA, proteins, and organelles. And then we can use PCR to amplify the DNA within that cell lysate. All right, so how do we get the DNA out of cells? And this is a big one, especially during... Um, right now in the time of COVID-19 safety protocols. Um, in general, um, I do find the best results and the most consistent results are, um, are gotten when your students are gonna rinse their mouths with saline and, and then perform the extraction from that. 
And also it has to be saline. Um, with our experiments, we just find that we do not get results, uh, good results if you use um, Gatorade, that there is something in the Gatorade that inhibits the polymerase chain reaction either. And you know, um, that does give us, um, you know, basically suboptimal to no results. So you'd wash your mouth out with saline, um, you would spit in a cup, you would centrifuge that down. Um, but again, in a time where there is, um, you know, a, a virus that is, can be easily spread through bodily fluids, through aerosols, through um, respiratory droplets, you know, we wanna protect ourselves and our students. So we are not gonna be rinsing our mouth with saline and spitting into a cup. And so as a substitute, we can extract DNA from the sheath cells that are pregnant, present in the hair follicle. And I tried with my cell phone camera to be able to pull out a hair and to show you what it looks like live. Um, but even though my cell phone camera is pretty good, even though my webcam is pretty good, you know, it just wasn't able to focus on that small detail. So I have a picture of it here. Um, and so this is tricky because when you're doing this protocol, your students are going to have to tweeze a hair and get the roots as you can see them here. So you can see there's like a clear whitish, it almost looks like a residue when you pull the hair out. Um, and and that, that residue is the cells, and those are the cells that build the hair. Hair are, itself um, does not have any DNA, it is just keratin, but these sheath cells are living cells and they are where the DNA is. So your students would pull out their hair. Um, you know, I actually find that eyebrows work better um, than your head hair. Um, I think it's because they're a little thicker, maybe they have more sheath cells around it, so you're not seeing my picture. Um, you should be able to see the gel box here, um, and then I have the slides up. Oh, these slides are not, huh, interesting. Let me figure out why my window capture is not working. Thank you, here we go. Um, so thank you, um, I, I, can you see, I hope you can see everything now. Um, for some reason, when I changed over to my, um, my view, um, it did change the, um, it changed the way things were um, presenting, but you should be able to see the changes in slides now. Um, so let me know if that is appropriate. You should be able to see a picture um, with the hair and the sheath cell. Okay, good, thank you. Um, so let's where, so where was I? Okay, so we've got to, we got to get these cells. And so I actually do find that pulling the hair from the eyebrow, the hair is a little thicker. You tend to have more of this root sheath um, on the cell. And these are the cells that, um, you know, are, are helping to build the hair. Um, you're going to want to pull out several hairs. Um, and the protocol, if you request the slides, you can click on the, the link and it will take you directly to the protocol. Um, where you can use this, um, you can extract the um, hair cell. Um, you, it gives you the protocol. You're gonna wanna use several hairs. You're gonna wanna trim them. If you're taking them from the head, you're gonna wanna trim them to their shorter um, so that they do fit in the centrifuge tube. Um, and then, you know, we'd extract the DNA um, in the buffer by, you know, incubating it for, um, you know, over a period of time. Um, this slices the cells and then the DNA is used in PCR. So if you need to break up the protocol over several days, so you know if you're teaching, if your students are in on Monday and Tuesday and then they don't come back until the next week, this is a great place to stop. The other place would be you can your students could add this, the primers um, and then you could freeze. Um, but the biggest, the most important part here is that you wanna freeze the samples if you're not gonna amplify them right away and you don't wanna add the PCR Edvo bead until right before the amplification. So, you know, you can have your students add the PCR bead to the sample, but you wanna make sure to amplify those samples, you know, at the end of the class period. The longer you leave those samples together, um, the more likely you are to have the enzyme, the TAC enzyme, you know, lose activity and then you wouldn't get good results. So if you want your students to be able to add the PCR bead, you know, make sure you have the EdvoCycler ready to go. Um, and ready to amplify. If you're amplifying several classes at the end of the day, um, you know, you don't want them to add that PCR bead until, you know, right before you load the samples into the thermal cycler and turn it on. And so we have tested our protocol with all of our human PCR kits. Um, all the reagents needed for hair DNA isolation are included in the kit. 
And so we actually do have, um, you know, an in-depth blog post that covered this as well. So please be sure to check out our blog post. Again, when you request the slides in the link, I will send you the, I will send you the information and you can click to it and get to it that way. Okay, so let, now we've got the samples loaded. I've told you about how to extract the DNA. Let's talk about PCR. Um, so in 1984, so this is in many of our lifetimes, uh, Dr. Kerry Mullis devised a simple and elegant method to copy specific pieces of DNA known as the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. So Mullis was working at a chemist in the DNA synthesis department at the Cetus Corporation, and this is in California. And the anecdote that he had told um, was that he was driving along a highway late at night thinking about DNA synthesis when he came up with the idea that short synthetic DNA pieces could be used to target a specific DNA sequence and that this could be used for amplification. And so the idea sounded crazy. And my understanding is that Mullis had had several other crazy ideas that did not pan out. So after some amount of con convincing, uh, Cetus put Mullis and other scientists on this project full time where through meticulous experimentation, they determined that this technique could actually take the smallest amount of sample and amplify it. So it's incredibly powerful. We, we can expand it so that we could do a huge amount of analysis um, without having to subclone something into bacterial cells and then grow it up to large amounts and extract it. So this, you, you know, you put your template in a tube and within three hours or so, um, you have millions of copies of DNA. And so because of its ease of use and its ability to rapidly amplify DNA, um, it quickly became a common technique in the biotechnology lab. And today we know it's indispensable in medical and life sciences lab. We also see it in the forensic science lab to create DNA profiles that can be used to identify suspects or victims. And it's used daily in genetic engineering to amplify pieces of DNA to be spliced into systems that allow us to make lots of biological molecules in cells, so like biopharmaceutical drugs. And so this technology won Carrie Mullis and others the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 93. So this is pretty amazing stuff. So this discovery made in the early 80s won the Nobel Prize in the 90s, and it really revolutionized molecular biology in, in many of our lifetimes. But I think one important thing that I like to bring up when talking about the scientists who did this um, is that scientists are human. And so, um, you know, especially prominent scientists, you know, scientists are people with their own, um, you know, biases um, and their, their own, um, you know, attitudes. And so it's important to acknowledge that while he was a brilliant scientist, Carrie Mullis was a complicated person. Um, and among other topics, your students may find when researching PCR that they'll see that Carrie Mullis was an HIV denialist and that he did not believe that the virus was responsible for AIDS. And so this is actually a great thing to bring up with your students. It's gonna teach us an important concept in science that scientific consensus is important. And a scientist can be incredibly right, their research can be groundbreaking and correct in some areas, and it could be, you know, incorrect in others. And so people can believe a hypothesis, but it needs to be supported by multiple lines of evidence. It needs to be reinforced and reproduced by multiple scientists, and then a consensus is formed in the scientific community. And so that's important to share with your students, especially in an era like right now, where scientific misinformation can easily be spread through the internet and through other sources. All right. So let's get back to PCR itself. Um, it's not a perfect analogy, um, but you can think of PCR like a DNA photocopier. So we're gonna start with one copy and we're gonna end up with millions. So let me move my gel box out of the way um, for a bit. And I am going to demonstrate PCR using our origami organelle. And so this origami organelle is gonna be a model that we can use um, to kind of simulate this DNA photocopier, this, this PCR process. And so again, we're gonna start with one double-stranded copy of DNA, and we are going to end up with millions by the end. So I'm gonna position it like this so that I can have both strands on here, okay? Um, and so these organ organelles are great because you can actually, if your students are partially hybrid and partially in person, you can actually have them do this part of the lab prep background at home. Um, you would be able to buy the origami organelle um, and you would be able with the, and print it as much as you want. So with the purchase of the model, you are licensed for unlimited single use, uh, use on a, for a single site or campus. And these are gonna be perfect for distance learning because you can, your students can download it, print it at home um, and do this experiment together, um, you know, while they're home. 
And so PCR is going to use the same cells that our uh, same steps that our cells use to replicate DNA. Um, and so when I teach PCR, I always like to teach it in the context of DNA replication. So first, we have to separate our two DNA strands, right? So we have our five prime strand and our three prime strand. So in the cell, um, this would happen. Um, oops, where is it? Yeah, this is gonna the enzyme we have in the cell. We have the enzyme helicase, which unwinds the DNA into single strands. Um, in PCR, we actually heat the sample to 40, 94 degrees centigrade, which separates the double-stranded DNA. And the high heat breaks the hydrogen bonds between the DNA-based pairs. And this, in PCR, is known as denatriation. So next, if we were in the cell, um, what we would do is um, the enzyme primase would come along. And I'm actually going to focus on one DNA strand here, um, you know, but this would be happening with both strands, obviously. Um, so... We, um, next, if we were in the cell, the enzyme primase would come along and it would build short RNA primers along the DNA strands. And this allows the enzyme that builds DNA or DNA polymerase um, to start catalyzing the phosphodiester bonds between nucleotides. And so DNA polymerase can't build DNA on its own though, so it's gonna need these primers to get started. So in PCR, we design specific primers to bind and target a specific sequence. And so, um, what I want to do is I am going to skim through um, my strand of DNA um, and I am going to look to see where my primer complements. Um, so we can see we have AAG, it's going to match here, TTC. Um, and so that's going to target one sequence for amplification by PCR. And so these primers, again, allow the polymerase enzyme to have somewhere to get started. And so here we can see now that we have a primer, our TAC DNA polymerase um, can bind. And so in PCR, we design these primers to bind and target specific DNA sequences. We're gonna adjust the temperature of our sample to something between 40 and 65 degrees centigrade, which allows the primers to anneal or bind to the complementary base pairs, and we call this the annealing temperature. So once the primers are bound, um, we are going to, th th this allows DNA polymerase to um, target the DNA and start building, TNA, start building DNA using each strand as a template. And so in replication, this would be copying the entirety of each chromosome so that we end up with a perfect copy of each of our 46 chromosomes. So those are the 23 pairs we looked at before. In PCR, what we do is raise the temperature to 72 degrees C, which allows polymerase to attach to the open end of the primer and fill in the nucleotides. So we can model that by having the second strand come in, um, you know, and you would have the, oh, the enzyme moves in this direction. So I do have it the wrong way. Um, you, you, what you see is that it's labeled there, um, and I did not see that when I put it down here. Um, I had them oriented for both strands and I kind of don't have enough room to show both strands at the same time. Um, but what you can see is that we would have this, the enzyme is going to move in this direction and that would be how it would replicate the DNA. Um, once the primers are bound, um, we are going to amplify DNA. Um, now in replication, we're done until the cell divides again. For PCR, though, we are going to keep repeating these steps 25 to 35 times to create a ton of DNA. So we would separate the DNA again, a primer would bind here, we would get a primer binding to this strand of DNA. That's the wrong primer, let me grab the right primer. Well, anyway, so we would have another primer binding here, um, and then we would have the second strand of DNA um, being copied um, Is this the right one? Let me find the other copy. Where's my other short copy? It must have fallen on the floor when I knocked things off behind the scenes. But anyway, we would have another copy of the DNA, um, which would then bind again. And we'd have two, and then we'd have four, and then we'd have eight. Um, and, and this is going to basically be an exponential growth in DNA. Um, we use a specialized machine called a thermal cycler. Um, to automate the changes in temperature. Each cycle doubles the number of copies in the tube, giving us many, many millions of copies of DNA before the process is over. So it's an exponential growth from, you know, if we're starting with two copies, we go from two to four to eight, 16, 32, and so on. 
So if you want to bring math into your classroom, and you know we all do because we're into, we're having STEM lessons, um, we would we can have your students calculate this. So if you started with five copies and cycled for twenty five cycles, how much DNA would there be at the end? You know that would be five to the twenty five, and you can have your students do that math. So here is the Edvo Cycler Junior. Let me bring that up. Um, I am going to show you how we program the Edvo Cycler Junior really quickly, um, and just as a reminder. Um, we do have that link in the chat. Um, you can actually sign up to win one of these Edvo Cycler Juniors. Um, let me, I'm going to show you really quickly, um, you know, how to do some of the basic functions on the Cycler. Um, when you start up, you can see it's got this vivid color screen, um, which I love. I love that the operating system is in the Cycler. You don't have to connect it to an external um, device to be able to get it to um, work. Um, you know, everything is contained right here. That means there's no additional cost to, um, you know, the thermal cycler. Um, it, I, I personally think it is the premier personal thermal cycler on the education market today. Um, this unit has precision um, thermoelectric heating and cooling power. Um, it's affordable, it's easy to use and program, and there's no external monitor necessary. So again, be sure to sign up. We are going to do the drawing very shortly, um, within a couple of, probably next week. Um, so, you know, we're giving one of these away, so you should definitely sign up. So I'm going to show you really quickly how to, um, you know, how to load a saved program. So the kit that we're running today is 334. So you see, I, I clicked on saved. The unit comes pre-programmed with all of the Edvotech programs. So we would click right there. Um, what you can see on this side of the screen is that it shows you all of the steps, it shows you the temperatures, the times, um, and then when you're ready to go, you would just hit run. And what it would do is bring up this run screen so that your students um, can watch what's happening in real time. Um, you can see here we have an initial incubation. Um, this is the denaturation step where our two DNA strands are separating. Um, again, then we go to our annealing temperature where the primers bind and then at 72 degrees C, that's where we have that annealing temperature. Um, and you can see right here, we have indicated um, the number of cycles and that will count up as we continue to cycle. So I'm gonna hit stop really quickly. Do we wanna stop running this program? You know, this isn't gonna let you, um, this isn't gonna let you um, stop a program unless you really want to, which is important. So we stop this program, we're gonna go home if you want to edit a program, you can just go right here to edit um, and it would open up the program. The nice thing is you also can't overrun, you can't overwrite any of these programs. Um, this Edvo Cycler Junior um, can run 16 samples at once. Um, so it is a personal PCR machine, but personal doesn't really mean like one person. Um, you can still fit, you know, depending on your class size, you can get 16 samples in here. Um, the Edvo Cycler um, 2, um, which is our full classroom size unit, um, can run a lot more samples than that. I believe it is 48. Um, Maria in the chat box will um, confirm that. Um, but that unit is gonna have the similar interface to this, but it's gonna be a little bit, little bit larger um, and it's gonna run more samples. If you wanna have a new sample, like if you're doing PCR on your own, developing your own kits, again, super easy to program. Um, you're just gonna click. You're going to put in your different times, your different temperatures, um, and, you know, ready to go. So very simple, intuitive to program. Your students can do it. Your students can program it themselves. You can have them program it. When you're done, you hit save. I'm going to delete this because that was just a silly program um, that I was just trying. Let's go home. Another nice feature is that we have this instant incubate feature. Um, which I like, you know, if you want to do um, a restriction digest and perhaps you're um, you doing that if from your PCR samples, you can put your samples in here. Um, you can set the block temperature um, to whatever you want it to be. Um, set the time. Let's see. And then hit enter. And that will bring the block up to the temperature. So, oh, hit run. All right, and so that's gonna actually cool. You can see it's going to the temperature. So I'm gonna stop that. Um, and since you asked, I'm going to show you the size of the block. Let's see if I can get my camera in the right position. 
And so if I press this to open, um, you can see here is our 16 place block. Um, it's got a heated lid. Um, that heated lid is important for PCR and that keeps the sample from accumulating on the top um, of the thermal cycler. Um, it's really nice. You don't need to use mineral oil or wax beads or anything um, to keep your samples from, um, from evaporating. And so this is a great unit. Um, you know, uh, Maria will put the current price in the chat window. I believe it's $7.49. I believe it's on sale right now, Maria. Um, I, but she will be the one who can, but that is as of Thursday, October 22nd. Um, and the price, you know, is like, is able to change. So let me pull this out. Um, and we're going to talk a little if anyone has any more questions about the Edvocycler, you know, please feel free to put them in the chat box. We will answer them. Um, and, but let's talk a little bit more about what this, the sequences we are actually amplifying um, in the um, unit. And again, don't forget, we're running the contest. So be sure to sign up now. That is an incredible value. $750 is... 700 and I think the list price is 799 so it's a 799 dollar value currently at 749 um, but you can win one for free and you can't beat free um, so so let's actually talk about what we're looking at in with this PCR reaction oh, my camera is a little twisted let me get this lined up you can't really see I've got a little condensation going on in here it's a little warm that's okay um, the samples are still running um, but let's talk about the landmarks that we are analyzing using PCR. And so we're actually, uh, there are small single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs, um, and that's where the DNA base pairs at a specific location show variability. Again, that's that A versus T difference, where again, these are not, are not necessarily um, differences where, um, this, they're not necessarily differences that cause mutations or cause illness or even have any difference, but they are differences. Um, now, some of these single nucleotide polymorphisms um, are considered to be rest restriction fragment length polymorphisms or RIFLIPs. And so what does this mean? Um, now, let's just step back for a second. Our restriction endonuclease is a highly specific enzyme that cuts DNA into fragments based on its sequence. And it's basically like a molecular scissor, which can only cut at specific locations. And this sequence needs to be exact. So for example, the restriction enzyme ECHOR1 cuts DNA with the sequence GAATTC. And but you, can, you can see that um, in the figure. And let's say that second A is where a SNP can be, occur. It can either be an A or a T. And so the enzyme will only cut when the DNA has an A in that location. So if we look at the schematic, we have a segment of DNA um, here and there is a potential reflip. Now, if we were to um, take this DNA and run it on a gel, um, you know, from a person with an A and a person with a T, um, those two bands would look the same. However, um, when we cut with the Echo R1, we would see different results. For the sample with the polymorphism, so the sequence that had a T instead of an A, you know, we wouldn't be able to cut the DNA. So we would just see one fragment but where we have the correct sequence, um, we would have two fragments of DNA. And so these differences in the pattern allow us to distinguish between individuals. And so, so to recap, yes, you isolate the DNA. Um, well, in this case, um, I'm gonna move forward um, and, and talk about this a little more. This experiment that I'm running in particular is not a, an experiment where we digest the DNA. Um, but we are actually going to be using um, PCR to look at size differences um, with a different kind of RIFLIP called the VNTR. So let me get to the next slide and, and then I will, and that will, here's my slide where you can see um, the different cut sites result in different sizes of DNA. Um, and so what we can see is when we cut the DNA with different enzymes or with the same enzyme, the RIFLIP is in different positions, and um, we get different banding patterns. So another kind of RIFLIP, and this is the one that we're analyzing today, it doesn't, you don't need DNA enzymes to be able to visualize this kind of RIFLIP. Uh, and so this is a variable number of tandem repeat, or VNTR. Um, a VNTR is a short repetitive DNA sequence. The sequence repeat itself is generally between 15 and 35 nucleotides, 
They can be as short as two and as long as several thousand. And they can occur between five and 100 locations at, a, at times at a specific location. So if the VNTRs are considered to be a kind of RIFLIP because they change the restriction pattern by changing the differences between two enzyme sites. And so again, looking at the schematic, we're looking at two chromosomes present in one person's DNA sample. Again, these are heritable. So one of the chromosomes is from mom and one of them is from dad. We can see that there's a VNTR site between these two ECHOR1 sites. So in this case, um, we can see as we, when we amplify the DNA and we cut it with the restriction enzymes, we get two different fragments. Now with PCR, we can actually take this one step further and we don't need to use the enzymes to be able to visualize this RIFLIP, this VNTR. And so what we do is we create PCR primers that um, are basically flanking this repetitive DNA sequence um, and we amplify them with PCR. So again, we cut out that digestion step by amplifying things with PCR and then we run those samples on a gel. And so what we can see is each of these lanes on the gel are from different people. And we can see that we get a variety of different sizes of bands um, based on the individual's genetic combinations. And one of the reasons why this is so powerful is because we're not just getting a yes or no, an A or T difference because of that cut site. We are actually changing the length of our restriction fragment by having more or less of these repetitive DNA samples. So what you can see is that you know, two people differ not just between A and T, but they can have anywhere from 15 or five to 100 of these different sequences. And they can have that on two different chromosomes. And so what you can see is in this, in this example of gel, we have one person who's heterozygous, um, uh, one person who's homozygous for a particular VNTR, uh, meaning that they have the same number of repeats within those two DNA segments. And then we have multiple individuals who have different VNTR numbers of the VNTR between their restriction enzyme cut sites. And again, we amplify it with PCR instead of cutting it. Um, and that is a simple, fast, and effective way for your students to be able to analyze differences in their genome. And so this experiment that we showed, this is experiment 334, um, which is going to analyze the D1S80 DS1, D1 locus. And your students can actually do this analysis in the classroom, you know, once they are able to do, once, you know, if you're back in session. Um, so in this case, you extract the DNA, um, you amplify using PCR, you add the bead with the necessary ingredients, um, then you do the PCR and run the gel. And so D1S80 is a VNTR present on human chromosome 1, and this VNTR is a 16 nucleotide sequence that is repeated between 16 and 40 times. An individual can be heterozygous or homozygous, and the number of VTN VNTRs, again, between those PCR primers can difference, differ between people and differ between um, chromosomes, so the difference between the one you inherited from your mother and your father. And you can imagine how powerful this is for DNA analysis because now we're not just dealing with cut versus not cut DNA. We have DNA fragments that vary in size dramatically based on the number of VTRs present within a single locus. And furthermore, since each person has two chromosomes and each chromosome has a different number of VNTRs present, this amount of information that we can get is incredible. And so we can analyze Ooh, we're getting close to the end already. And so we can analyze, so I better talk more quickly. Um, and so we can analyze different locations within the genome, which give us a lot of information. And this figure from the National Human Genome Research Institute highlights several different ways scientists and clinicians analyze DNA sequence information to tell us about human health. Diagnose disease, pinpoint specific, fig specific figures that cause disease, help you make diagnostic decisions, help you make treatment decisions, um, you can see genetic risk factors, um, identify risk factors that can be passed to our children genetically, and so forth and so on. And so one reason why I think this is important to cover that PCR and PCR from human DNA is so important to cover in class is that it provides a topic for discussion for bioethics. So for example, is it ethical to use this information to identify potential suspects? So in the news, you may have heard a lot about familial DNA testing. Um, and so this is where you um, use um, DNA that people have uploaded for genealogical purposes um, for identifying potential suspects in crimes. You know, so is it ethical to use that information? Do you and your family members have the right to privacy if you upload your, your DNA information? 
Um, who owns this information? Do you own it or does the company who, um, who sequenced it for you own that information? Um, and furthermore, one thing that especially comes up in terms of heredity is, you know, is this information important? And so this is one thing um, that's important with indigenous communities um, is that, you know, the in membership to an indigenous community is from the community, not necessarily from um, your DNA sequence. And so um, there have been, you know, issues there where people are trying to sequence their DNA to prove um, you know, their, their heritage, um, but it's also used against them um, in many ways. And so this, there are no right answers to these questions, um, but it is another place to have your students read the literature, um, read articles and form an opinion. Um, and this can be used to write a persuasive essay, again, encouraging your students to use those common core literacy skills, to think about science, to interpret it science, um, and to know, um, you know, that science can help us answer questions, but there is an ethical side to scientific discovery as well. All right, so let's get to the recap. So here is a, an example gel. Um, I am going to turn off my power supply um, and I'm going to pull out the True Blue 2. So um, again, if you want to learn more about the specifics of electrophoresis, there are multiple electrophoresis workshops um, on our YouTube channel where we talk about it. This, I'm using the True Blue 2. Um, in my gel, I have CyberSafe. That is a DNA stain that binds with our DNA and labels it um, with a bright color that can be visualized um, using blue light. And so True Blue 2 um, is you know, safe for classroom use, non-mutagenic, um, and very easy to use. You put it in the gel um, and it stains the DNA while the gel is running. Let me put the lid down and turn the gel on. And so what you can see here is you can see, let me turn all of my lights off so you can get a better view. Um, and so what you can see here um, is that we have DNA fragments that have been amplified. Um, the, here is our DNA standard, which was asked about before. Um, that is a set of DNA molecules of known sizes that we compare to. This first lane here is our control sample. And so what you can see is our, in that control, this person was heterozygous. You can see two different bands of two different sizes. Um, and that was from our control DNA. Um, what you can see actually here, um, and so this is different from my test that I did earlier. Um, this is our cheek cell DNA. Um, and you can see there was no amplification. Um, so what does that mean? Um, that means something went wrong. Um, maybe the PCR Edvo bead wasn't added, maybe the DNA template wasn't added um, to the reaction. Um, but this is important um, to show your students, you know, science is messy, um, doesn't always work right every time we do it. Um, and these mistakes are just as important as our successes when it comes to science um, because you know, your students need to think about them, analyze what went wrong, and then um, you know, be able to adapt the next time they do the experiment. Let me move this down a little bit so that we get rid of some of that glare. Um, and then in this third size, you can lean, uh, fourth lane here, you can see that's the DNA that was extracted from the hair cells. And you can see that there is one a bright, beautiful band there. Um, and that is the DNA that was extracted from the hair cell and then amplified by PCR. And so um, what this should be showing you uh, is if done properly, that there is no significant difference between the hair cell and the cheek cell protocol. Um, and the cheek cell in general is easier and more consistent. Of course, um, there are always opportunities to um, have experimental error in even the easiest experiments. And so this is an instance of experimental error. <laughs> um, we amplify this locus using PCR and then we stain it with CyberSafe 2. All right, and so we've come to the end of this experiment. So if anyone has any questions, um, I'm going to do my recap, ask them now. Um, but basically, um, what PCR is a simple and elegant way to amplify DNA in vitro. In this experiment, we isolated the DNA. Um, we added primers, which target a specific DNA sequence for amplification. We had our PCR bead that includes our PCR enzymes um, and the regions needed to build DNA in vitro. Um, we used our Edvocycler Junior to amplify the DNA. 
Um, and then we removed it, we ran electrophoresis, and we visualized our samples using the um, True Blue 2. So this Nobel Prize winning technology is easy to perform in your classroom. Um, you know, and EdWatech has kits that not only focus on extracting human samples um, for PCR, um, but also from cells. You can also do PCR from, um, you know, pre-purified DNA that we provide. Um, we basically have an experiment that would meet any of your needs. And this is Nobel winning technology that's easy to perform in your classroom. And then experiments like this, which is a human genetics experiment, are going to provide an opportunity to, to discuss bioethics in your classroom. And I think that's important in science now, especially, um, you know, with the information that we can collect through genetic information uh, to talk about not only what the information is, but what it means. And so, again, um, the link is in the presentation. The link is in the live chat. Um, if you are interested, if you would like the slides, um, please be sure to click that link to sign up for um, the slides. We will send you a professional development certificate as well um, when the slides are available. Um, don't forget, we're also giving away an Edvo Cycler Jr. Um, so be sure to sign up at edvotech.com backslash contest. Um, now I'm happy to answer questions if anyone has them. Um, again, you know, here is our um, gel. Um, one of the reasons I like this True Blue 2 is because it's also a white light box. So if you are staining your DNA gels with a blue stain, like our flash blue stain, um, this unit is an all-in-one. Um, you can just open it up. Um, I can open it up for you. Um, you know, I'll just talk for a minute or two while if there, you know, anyone who has any more questions, um, you know, feel free to ask them. But what I'll do is I'll open this up. Um, ooh, and that's very bright. Um, but what you can see is here our gel. You can see our loading dye here. Um, if you were doing a dye electrophoresis or a DNA electrophoresis experiment or even a protein electrophoresis experiment, um, you can use this white light box to visualize it. And so it's really nice because this is, you know, in an era where, you know, funds are limited, um, you know, this is a great unit because it can do the white light and the blue light um, visualization. Um, what does the True Blue 2 cost? Um, Maria will put that in the chat window um, and she can link to it as well um, with the cost. Um, it is very affordable in terms of what it is um, when compared to other um, blue light transilluminators. Um, it is very versatile. Um, you, one other thing that I like, I don't have any plates here with me now, but if you do transformation, you can also put on your GFP transformation plates here. Um, and those GFP, and you can excite GFP using the blue light transilluminator as well. Um, so the True Blue 2 as of today um, is, which is again, October 22nd, 2020, um, it is $299. So it's a great unit multi-purpose and you know really fantastic for the classroom um so if there aren't any more questions um i just want i i want to just point out one more thing that i do i don't have pcr racks at home so i use play-doh um, as my pcr tubes or should i say the the childhood dough that many of us know and love um, you know there are lots of different ways to adapt to doing science um, at home so it doesn't seem like there are any more questions um, in the chat. So again, fill out the form um, for the slides. Um, please sign up for the um, EvoCycler um, Junior giveaway. Um, and thank you so much for your time. If you need us, please reach out to us at info at edvotech.com or you can try one of our social media channels. And we really look forward to helping you get biotechnology into your classrooms. So thank you so much for joining us. I hope to see you soon at another um, live stream. Um, we'll probably be back um, in two weeks um, for another live stream. So that'll be at the beginning of November, believe it or not. How crazy is that? Um, and we're looking forward to helping you get biotechnology in your classroom. So stay safe. Thank you for joining us. And we will see you very soon. Have a fantastic day. Um, and, you know, um, looking forward to seeing you get another live.